Thank you. Thank you. I would like to thank the organizers, the three foundations, and Chiara Tonelle, who is not just the Secretary General of this uh, um, Congress, but also the very soul, and with a very special uh, 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 thought of gratitude to Umberto Veronesi, who has gathered us here yet for another Congress. And uh, 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 because of uh, uh, hospitality, uh, due to uh, the, the hospitality duty that I will feel, I will speak English, and I know I will be translated. Uh, with uh, uh, photos that I took yesterday, when I had a chance to visit uh, the wonderful church right here next door, uh, I entered and I saw this blessing hand made of uh, fonts. Uh, and uh, um, I first thought actually that uh, these uh, veins on the marble were actually part of the marble itself until I realized that they were actually the reflection of uh, those fonts from various languages of the world onto the marble. It led me to think about uh, one of, I think, the key points of digitization, namely the transfer of information, in this case, across different surfaces, but importantly also across different matters, and what changes in this transition, which is, I think, a theme that has been percolating throughout uh, this conference. I thought I had 30 minutes, but we are already at 23, so I will try <laughs> to retune. Um, so let me start with uh, this tweet that I received a couple of years ago that tells us that typing 60 words a minute, eight hours a day, it takes 50 years to type the human genome, that's 78 million tweets. Now, that's interesting because uh, uh, it's basically uh, sort of translating the length of a human genome into the metrics of a tweet. And so I think it's a very powerful example of what can we do once we understand, probe, and intervene into life as a text, which will be the running thread of my talk. And in a nutshell, I will be telling you about uh, the reasons why I think that the life sciences have been expanding so much into the very fabric of our time. Because this is rooted in uh, their eminent flexibility. And this flexibility entails at its most basic two capacities. On the one hand, encompassing an increasing range of biological objects and functions in digital format. And on the other, that of intervening into those biological objects and functions by harnessing these digital codes through a panoply of molecular switches. And of course, we have lots of evidences of this flexibility, first of all, in the sheer explosion of questions and context to, to which it is being applied. We heard it already from the introduction from Chiara, from molecule to omic profiles, from cellular lineages to organs, from organisms to environments, all more or less classical level of biological organization are now amenable to the digitizable ambition of the life sciences. And I will provide you in the first part a number of examples which I think are illustrative of uh, what happens when uh, the digitization really enters and becomes part and parcel of living matter. We have talked a lot in these two days, these wonderful two days of digitization, but here I would like to touch on a point that I think has not really been covered uh, yet, namely what happens when the digitization is a digitization of and within the flesh. And let's start with Dick and Jane, sort of a prototypical pair for those of you who were not raised in America, of characters that would be familiar to almost uh, every American child. And uh, when Jane grows up, uh, she may actually become uh, uh, the user of so-called Next Gen Jane. It's one of the startup in biotech that acquired uh, the greatest amount of venture capital last year. And it is aiming at, as you see here, empowering women. And basically what they are the, the, the developing is a so-called smart tampon. So a tampon that women would be able to use once a month during their cycle. But this tampon would actually then be sequenced and subjected to a number of laboratory tests in order to monitor regularly their health. Now, if you probe a little further on the website of NextGenJane, 
you find this iconography of a face that uh, exposes uh, its uh, sort of, of deeper layer. And you find here what I found particularly interesting, namely uh, the quote that your body is constantly talking to you, letting you know when you're sick or, or exhausted. Biological markers are the words your body uses to communicate internally. What if you could decipher the language and listen to the chatter? So we, here we have suddenly this, this Cartesian moment in which the res cogitans needs to listen to the chatter of the res uh, extensa, and uh, the digitization suddenly becomes uh, the, the molecular conduit through which uh, this dichotomy between res cogitans and res uh, extensa actually unfolds. And now, this was also referred to as the quantified vagina, the, the sort of, you know, the, the jargon name for, for this startup company. And in the words of uh, one of the co-founders, she, she says, I had this epiphany, if we need large amounts of blood from women on a regular basis, well, they bleed every month, it's such a rich biological matrix that you're shedding every single month. So now the blood of the monthly cycle becomes a rich biological matrix a key transition, right, a key conceptual and epistemic transition to enable this digital depth into the body. Now, what is the issue, however? The issue that I would like to raise your attention to is that uh, Jane may be using this tampon and getting her blood sequenced on a monthly basis to monitor a number of parameters. But of course, Jane is also tweeting. Hey, she may be tweeting uh, about the websites she visits, about the kind of sex she has, about the number of partners she has, more generally about her social life. And now, in the digital world, these two things can be seamlessly overlaid onto each other, because DNA has become the equivalent of a lingua franca. Not necessarily DNA qua genome, not DNA as genome, but DNA as the sequence, as the string, as the text, that can be probed at these very different levels, which now can be overlaid and made seamlessly overlappable and interchangeable. We see another example, this time of digitizing space. When I say space here, I mean brain space. We heard it during the first day from Sheila Jasanov's talks about how some of the diagrams that we, are, that, that we were seeing, the, the brains, they, they actually had the iconography of brains. They were sort of wiring diagrams in the shape of brains. But here, actually, what the ambition of this work is, is to actually understand the brain as a problem of sequence. You see it quite nicely here. This is an old representation of a reflex. You put your hand too close to a fire, you feel pain, and you retract the hand. And the point is, we want to understand the wiring of the brain including the, the wiring that underlies that reflex. And here you have, by now, the inevitable uh, picture of the sequencing costs going down. So the idea that these colleagues had was to say, well, let's use, in this case, a virus called the rabies virus. The details are really not important, but it's a virus that basically goes from neuron to neuron. So if you engineer it in a way that it actually inserts a bit of sequence of DNA into the genome of one neuron, and then it travels to the neighboring neuron, and there it also leaves a scar of its integration, you end up tagging different neurons. And you see here that suddenly this wiring diagram has transformed into a series of barcodes. And you actually read here very clearly the thrust, the goal of this whole field converting connectivity into a sequencing problem, right? Understanding the architecture and the function of the brain once you reduce it to a sequencing problem. And that's the result. You now come from a mouse brain, idealized, to a pixelated mouse brain in which the pixelated digital language is enabled by this barcoding of various neurons. Perhaps even more intriguingly, and this is very recent work from uh, MIT co 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 colleagues that came out really a couple of weeks ago, digitizing time. 
So we read that uh, to enable a deeper understanding of biology, they engineered human cells that are able to report on their own history based on genetically encoded recorders. And of course, you will note that the person who did it, Timothy Liu, is presented as an associate professor of electrical engineering and co 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 computer science. And only at the very end, we learn that there is also biological engineering. This, of course, tells you also how much this world is actually reconfiguring uh, a disciplinary belongings and relationships be 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 between disciplines. So what do they do? Well, they use the molecule that has already been mentioned once at this conference, CRISPR-Cas9. Some of you may have heard of genome editing. Uh, very briefly, a combination of proteins and RNAs that over the last three years have been transforming uh, not only biology, but parts of society that have started to dream or have visions of what biology can achieve, namely because they do very easily something that has been uh, a sort of a holy grail of many scientists for a long time, namely changing in a very precise manner any letter of the DNA pretty much at will. So I will come back to that uh, in a couple of slides. But what these, co co these colleagues in Cambridge did was to say, well, if uh, this is uh, this protein which uses this a, a small molecule of RNA to actually cut the DNA, and this DNA then gets repaired, but every time it gets repaired with a scar, what would happen if I now have this Cas9 I make it in a way that it responds to an environmental trigger, in this case, to inflammation. And I build a system in which every time that I activate it, I actually induce a scar in the DNA. So that at the end of the process, a year from now, I can count the scars on the DNA. I can simply read it. And that reading is a measure of how many times the cells in which this circuit was built has been exposed to an inflammatory stimulus. Now you understand the power. They say, and they are right, we want to make history recordable. Now obviously mankind has been recording history since the time that we call it history, because otherwise it would have been prehistory. But here, the recording is recording into DNA. Think about the applications. They put the cells in, into mice to actually have, after one year, the, the readout of how often the mouse had been inflamed. You could imagine putting them into a pig if you want to know how much sunlight the pig has been exposed to, and, and, and. It's not the only approach. This is a Japanese cartoon. The Japanese, as you know, thrive in graphics. And so uh, the epigenome project of Japan represented uh, epigenetics as uh, a project that aims at understanding how our ways of life, our style of life, uh, actually changes not DNA per se, but the way in which DNA is used. As we say in the lab, the way in which DNA is expressed, namely gene expression, gene regulation. And in many ways, and I'm quoting here from a work by myself and Maurizio Meloni, what epigenomics is trying to do today is to understand how our environmental exposures, when they are stable enough to leave a mark, not necessarily on the DNA, but on the way in which the DNA is used by the cell, well, can I use the mark as a trace of where you have been, in which countries you have lived, what kind of food you have been eating in the last 20 years, and so forth. And that's why we wrote, the promise is to capture the analogical vastness of environmental signals through the digital representation of their molecular responses if what seemed irreducibly analogic, the social, the environmental, the biographical, the idiosyncratically human that we have seen at this conference so many instances of, needs to be overlaid onto the digital genome of the informationally right age in a dyadic flow of reciprocal reactivity, it seems that this overlay can succeed only once the analogic is interrogated, parsed, and cast into genome-friendly, code-compatible digital representations. 
But this really doesn't stop simply at the level of DNA or at the other molecules that actually sort of are overlaid onto DNA. It by now extends, for example, also to cells. And in fact, uh, several of us routinely talk about cells off the shelf. This is largely due to work over the last couple of decades, uh, sort of accelerating in the last decade, that basically allow us to change one cell type from our body into any other cell type by understanding the digital, co the digital combination of very special molecules called transcription factors that themselves regulate many other genes. The details, again, are not important. What is in, 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 what is important to realize is that we are treating cells as a digital problem in order to interconvert one into the other, to the extent that uh, in leading journals, one talks about cell fate plug and play, treating the cell with the same epistemology as an app. And so this is uh, the by now classical epigenetic landscape that Conrad Waddington introduced uh, to describe what could happen when uh, a cell at the beginning of development that has ahead of it all of its potential roots trickles down and acquires specific identities. In the words of uh, the, one of the fathers of developmental biology, we are standing and walking with parts of our body which could have been used for thinking had they developed in another part of the embryo. Well, now we can, in a sense, go back in time and do these transitions. And we can do them in a fully digital manner. This is a website called Mogrify, coming from a very prestigious publication last year, in which you are actually invited to enter your starting cell type, your, fin your finishing cell type. You press a click, and what you get is a list of the genes that you need to alter in order to do this interconversion in a way that is as digital as it gets. And we apply this kind of technology, this kind of epistemology in our own lab. These are cortical organoids, namely little bits of tissues that recapitulate the way in which our cerebral cortex develops, except that they do it in vitro. So we take skin cells from patients, in this case patients with neurodevelopmental disorders, and we reprogram them by treating the cell very much as a digital ph 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 phenomena. And once we have done it, we are able to grow what I have previously called avatars, representations of the body outside of, of, of the body, enabled by this digital conceptualization. So indeed, as the title of a very good, good, good book suggested a, a couple of years ago, we have indeed, we are in a time of life out of sequence. And of course, we all are aware that we are, first and foremost, a textual species. We have evolved, we live, our forms of social life unfold through texts, written text, oral text. And of course, in this light, the famous statement by Jacques Derrida, in a pas de haut text, there is no outside text, which of course was a, an expression of postmodernism, actually now meets what is in a sense the final product of the modernist trajectory once we understand life as text. And here I would like to then juxtapose the tweet with which I started with another experiment coming from fiction. This will be the first of two that I will make today. You will recall also from the keynote uh, opening lecture by Sheila Jasanoff, I think the use of actually looking at fiction for sort of imagining parallel ways of thinking through these issues. And you will, you will be perhaps not, not surprised to hear that a couple of years ago, a very prominent American writer decided to write a short story which was then later published in The New Yorker as a series of tweets. So she constrained herself to the matrix of tweets. So this tweet, these famous 140 characters, are at once a metric through which we can reread DNA. They're also a metric through which we can do, as in this case, literature. And it's interesting if you read the, this quote that the author says, I found myself imagining a series of terse mental dispatches, in that case from a female spy of the, of the future. She was interested in doing this because of the intimacy of reaching people through their thorns. <laughs> 
But interesting, of course, she wrote these bulletins by hand in a Japanese notebook that had eight rectangles on each page. So you see again the point I was making at the beginning between the hand and the marble, the materiality, right? So she's writing into it this eminently digital metric in order to reach people into the intimacy of their houses, but she's doing it first on a Japanese paper after she has put rectangles that can surround neatly the 140 characters. So I would like to spend the last uh, part of the talk uh, thinking with you about acts of reading. Of course, the, on the left, there is a homage to Venice, the San Girolamo by Antonello da Messina, a painting that was most likely painted in this very city, at a time, of course, in which the act of reading was an eminently solitary act and an act for very few people. Many years later, we have a collective act of reading DNA. This is the day in which uh, President Clinton announces uh, the collective reading of the human genome as a sort of a moonshot collective resource. And 10 years later, it's a single individual, admittedly quite famous, who actually talks about her own DNA. So reading goes from collective to individual. And the question is, uh, now that we can write, how is this act of writing unfold? Ding. It's interesting that this is Vermeer, and this is uh, Science, uh, a paper that came out a couple of months ago, and which you know uh, took by surprise m m m many people because the the discussion for the last part of the last year had actually been uh, on. Uh, the opportunities or the dangers of engineering the human genome through CRISPR-Cas9, as I alluded to previously. But of course, a number of scientists who wrote, we need technology and an ethical framework for genome scale uh, engineering, suggested a genome project right. Namely, well, we actually don't even need to think about editing an existing genome. We can think about building it from scratch. Which, is, which, if you think about it, is you know, the apex of digitization. Once we understand life as a digital code, well, why not just type it and then convert it into a very long chemical molecule and put it into a cell? So I will give you just one example that comes from uh, sort of my work years ago when I was, in fact, in the team of scholars gathered around Sheila Jasanoff in the project on reframing rights that you heard about on the first day. Uh, this was the time of great controversy in the United States. Uh, it was the time of cloning of human embryonic stem cells, uh, the attempt to find ethical solutions to a bitter political divide. And so in the Bush Council on Bioethics, uh, uh, a bioethicist suggested that uh, if one was troubled by the idea that uh, if you put, as in the Dolly example, but applied to humans, a nucleus of somatic cells into an egg, and you would get a cloned embryo, and you were troubled by the fact that this embryo could become a cloned human, all you needed to do, really, was to disable a gene to start with that you knew would be essential to develop. So that by the time you create this new kind of biological artifact, uh, you knew that it could never become a cloned human because it lacked one gene to actually become human. And this actually was proposed by the Bush Council on Bioethics and actually became a real thing in the labs of, of MIT and was eventually published uh, in Nature. To the disdain of one of the members of that same committee who said, normally we generate a word to describe a biological phenomenon, here we seem to be tinkering with biological phenomena to have it fit the meaning of a word. And of course, I thought always that he's both right and wrong at the same time. He is right because that's exactly what happened. But he's wrong in not really understanding and appreciating that this is precisely the thrust of contemporary biology, insofar as once we have digitized life, we can splice values in our life. And in fact, you read here that they also said that which gene should be taken off will depend on the level of disorganization of this thing that would allow us to be quiet and think that it would be morally unproblematic. Interestingly, a couple of months later, one of the uh, foremost scientists 
mentioned this discovery or this invention, actually, it's an invention, by saying, you know, if we had had to ban human cloning by law, we should have had a ban. Now, actually, we don't even need a ban because we have the technology that prevents that by inserting it into DNA. So you see here that we are juxtaposing two sort of kinds of uh, sort of two law and genetic engineering as two technologies of moral order. And so that I actually wrote uh, that this artifact became owned its existence to criteria that became scientific only within a template of moral assumptions and vice versa became political only within a template of scientific options. So in the very final slide, uh, I think we ought to ask ourselves who is doing the reading, who is doing the writing, and are we really digital native or rather digital naive? Namely, we may be very good at sort of tipping on our devices, but if we don't ask the questions of who is doing the reading and who is doing the writing, once the reading and writing are within the flesh itself, we may well run the risk of being naive. And so the last e e example is from uh, a website that I found very interesting, another startup company acquiring a lot of capital called Freenom that aims at actually sequencing just the free DNA that you have running in your blood as a way to measure a number of traits and possible conditions. So it's actually not dissimilar from next gen Jane, but it's actually even more general in its, in its ambition. I do not have the time to delve into the details of this rather remarkable quote, except that I was struck when the founders of this company proclaimed who they were in this order. We are technologists, we are scientists, we are people. And I think that these are all categories that we should actually ask ourselves all the time in this digital age, who we are and who are we speaking on behalf of. And so here I have, uh, in fact, the cover of the book I was referring to, in which, of course, uh, we were introducing collectively the notion of bioconstitutionalism, and aptly uh, the publisher chose we the people from the American Constitution, which became enshrined into DNA. And of course, this is another representation of a people located in history, which I think is quite interesting to juxtapose to another kind of people. This is from the Obama Initiative on Precision Medicine. Some of you may remember it from last year. There are many differences between these two pictures. The kind of details that we learn about these specific people and who are these people who are speaking for them and what are actually these people here? And what can we learn or know about this individual that is sort of coming to, to the fore? And what is the relationship that this individual has with the other people and with the technological platform that is actually enabled to having this kind of relief over that kind of relief? So I basically finished and I want to finish with a small story simply because I think that one of the great things of going to conferences, especially to these conferences, which has sort of never disappointed us over the years, is that uh, you come out of the conference transformed because you have heard other things. You have new thoughts. And I was uh, quite struck by this uh, uh, terminology used by Alessandro Curioni on the first day when he was t talking about ingested data. And this let me think about food, and of course now we are approaching lunch, so that's also in tune. But this of course has been for me an interesting week food-wise, not simply because of the quality of the food, but because it started with a presentation of a book by a very old school friend of mine. And this book came out this week, so my week actually opened with a presentation of, of this book, which is a, a kind of a dark fairy tale of a child who refuses to eat because he's afraid to be eaten by the parents. So it's, of course, a metaphor. It's a, it's a macabre metaphor about uh, the danger of eating in order not to become food for others. And it seems to me that there are a number of parallels with what we have been hearing in this week. First of all, childhood. It seems to me that the, an emerging theme is that we feel a bit like children, marveling at the options of the digital world, but also fearful about how best uh, 
to start working in it. There are, of course, dying dichotomies about exactly how much data we want to digest, how much restraint we want to exercise, and how much fear we have that having ingested too many data, we can become ourselves prey, data prey, of data predators in a way that we cannot control. And so I would like to end with the notion that uh, it may be useful to think of data through the language and conceptualization of metabolism. Because metabolism, of course, is a process that we understand to be heavily regulated, in which there are moments of acceleration, but also roadblocks. There are ways in which you accelerate a reaction, but also key gatekeepers that actually control the flux of the various metabolites. And if we go back to the first day, when we were invited to, to think about how we should act as citizens in the digital age, now that the digital has become so integrated into our flesh, I think that we ought to think in a creative way about these uh, regulatory options. I'll just finish here, thanking uh, my lab, our founders, and if you want to know more about what we do, here is the website. Thank you very much. <laughs>